We can all relate to the amount of stress we're feeling in recent days. We hear it in the news, in our social media, and in conversations. Pandemic, virus, joblessness, economic crisis, social unrest. Her worries are compounded. Will I contract the Is virus? my child Is safe to return to my country? country? It's a feeling of being at the end of our rope. But God invites us to trust Him. Through these trying times, we can rejoice knowing He has a plan and a purpose in these days. Using this time to better learn to live in faith, we will find peace as He walks alongside us. There is really hope at the end of your rope. There was a little girl who was sitting on the lap of her grandfather. And she was looking at his face. And it was, had all the wrinkles on it, the deep lines. And it was just a rough face. And she was looking at her, at her grandfather's face. And she just assumed that her grandfather had always looked this way from the very beginning of his life. But when she looked in the mirror, she would see herself and how smooth and young her face was. And she just couldn't understand. And so she asked her grandfather, Granddad, did, did, did God make you? And he laughed and said, well, of course God made me. And she said, well, I know he made me. I know what it is. God is getting better at making people, isn't he, grandfather? Isn't it funny what little children think and how they communicate? And speaking of grandfathers, there was an old grandfather clock that was sitting there in the hallway of a house for 80 years. And it would tick two ticks a second. And that meant that it would tick 172,000 ticks every day. And it would tick 62 million ticks every year. And after 80 years, it just lost hope. It just fell apart. And it looked just like this picture that I have for you to see. He got so disappointed, so sad, he went to a clock psychiatrist. And he said to the clock psychiatrist, all hope is lost for me. And the psychiatrist said, I don't understand. Explain what's going on. And he said, I've been ticking for 80 years, two ticks a second, and I can't face another year of 62 million ticks a, 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 a year. I can't face it anymore. And the clock psychiatrist said to him, well, could you though just tick one tick at a time? And the grandfather clock thought about that. And he said, yeah, I think I could tick one tick at a time. And did you know the best I've heard for the last 50 years, that grandfather clock just keeps ticking one tick at a time. Now, I know how silly that illustration sounds to you, but it is to illustrate this idea that God is teaching us to live one day at a time. And that is what I want to talk to you about today. Don't forget to live today. Have you been noticing the crazy things that people are doing today? I read a story about a guy who went to a restaurant and he ordered French fries and they brought the French fries out, the waiter did, but the waiter forgot the ketchup. And the man got so angry that he didn't bring ketchup that he stood up and with his fist smacked that waiter right in the face. Can you believe it over ketchup? And then I read a story about a woman who got tired of wearing these masks and she was walking into Office Depot and she decided, I'm not going to wear a mask inside Office Depot. So she took her mask down and she walked inside Office Depot. But there was another woman in Office Depot who did have a mask and she saw the woman come in without a mask and it made her so angry. She just ran for bore right at that woman, knocked her down and broke her arm because she wasn't wearing a mask. What is wrong with so many people today? What is happening so many people doing crazy things? I think people are so stressed out today and are at the end of their rope, but they don't understand that there is hope 
at the end of their rope. Jesus put it this way in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 34. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. What Jesus was really saying is, don't forget to live today. And that is what I want to talk to you about today. Now, this verse that Jesus said that I've just read to you was a part of a larger passage. So let's get the idea of what's happening in that passage to better understand what Jesus is teaching us. The first point of this passage is simply this. We don't have to live with worry. In fact, Jesus tells us three reasons why we don't. First, he says, you matter to God. Matthew chapter 6, verse 26, look at the bear, the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? There are billions of birds all over the world. God has created them all. God feeds them all. But you are far more important to God than the birds. And you know why we know? Because Jesus just said it. You matter to God. He says then, worry won't help you anyway. Look at the next verse, verse 27. And which of you taking thought, and that, though that phrase taking thought simply means to worry, and which of you who worry can add one cubit to his stature? Now a cubit for a man, he was speaking to these men, a cubit is the tip of the finger all the way to the elbow. And for the average man, that was about 18 inches, the tip of the finger to the elbow. And when we think of the word stature, we think of height. So was Jesus saying, who with worry can add 18 inches to his height? He's talking to men. I don't know of one man anywhere that wants to add 18 inches to his height. Maybe an inch or two, but not 18 inches. If I added, if somehow I, I had 18 more inches to my height, I'd be just under seven and a half feet. And my luck, I wouldn't be good at basketball, and I'd be seven and a half feet tall, and I would have to duck every time I went through a doorway. No, I don't want 18 more inches, and neither does any other man that I can think of. But the word stature doesn't just mean height. It also means length. And that's how Jesus was using the word stature in the Greek. He was describing the length of life and he was saying, who with worrying about their life can add even 18 inches to the length of their life? And the answer is nobody. You can take time away by heart disease through worry, by by not paying attention, walking across the, the street because you're so worried you don't look both ways. You and I can wound our life and hurt our life by worry, but we cannot extend our life through worry, and that's the very point he is making. Worry won't help you anyway. And the third thing he says is that God has promised to meet your needs. See how Jesus puts it in Matthew chapter 6, verse 28? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They don't labor or spend. And yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all of his glory was arrayed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today, and tomorrow was thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Jesus is saying to us, you matter to God. Worrying about tomorrow isn't going to change your life except for the worst. God's going to take care of you. And he wraps it all up by making this statement in in chapter 6, verse 31. So do not worry, saying, what will we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans, meaning people who don't know God, don't love God, don't care about God, aren't interested in God. For the pagans run after these things and your heavenly father knows you need them. You see, God already understands we need food to eat. We need a place to live. We need things in our life. God's not against things in our life. 
But God says to us, why don't you look to me? I'll take care of you. And then Jesus takes it to the next step. And notice what he then says. Trust God to take care of you in his timing. Trust God to take care of you in his timing timing. Listen to what he says, how he puts it in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. It's not wrong to have goals in our life. It's right to have goals. But what Jesus is saying is change the order of your goals. Start your goals with God in the center, and when you do, God will meet your needs in his timing. God knows you have needs. He knows you need things. And God says, I'll take care of you in my timing if you will put me first in your life. I wonder where God is in your life. For some of you, maybe he's number six. For some of you, he's maybe 96. How's that working out for you? You see, God tells us that if we don't put him first in our life, God won't meet our needs. God God will, will put his hand against us. How's it working out for you to put God so little in your life? The truth is, there are so many things that God would do in your life, needs that God would meet in your life, and all he is saying is, I want you to change the order of all these things in your life and put me first in your life. God doesn't want a place in your life. He wants preeminence in your life. And when you put God first in your life, something different begins to happen in you. God is saying, make me first and I will meet your needs. Trust my timing to do it. God has an appointed time to meet your need. Be patient with God's timing. Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 9 says it this way. A man's heart plans his ways, but the Lord directs his steps. It's good to plan. I'm a planner. I'm a strategist. I love it. It's how God wired me. It's how God wired many of you as well. It's good to make plans. It's good to put strategies together. But always as we do, know that God sees more than we see and that God will redirect our path from time to time. We're not robots. We, 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 he, he doesn't just move us around as though we are numb and we have no thought and we have no brain of our own. But here's what God does. Even in times in which we're not aware, God is actually moving our steps, closing doors, opening doors, to move our steps, redirect our path because he knows where he wants to lead our life. Listen to how the Bible puts it in Proverbs chapter three, verse five and six. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Now stop for just a moment. What does that mean? In all your ways, acknowledge acknowledge him simply means put him first in everything in your life. Isn't it interesting? This verse in Proverbs three, verse five and six is saying exactly what Jesus was saying in Matthew chapter six. Put God first. Trust him in the things of your life. And notice the promise that he gives to you. He will direct your path. I have so many people that say to me, how, ask me, how can I know the will of God? If God's going to direct my path, how can I know God's will in my life? What they're hoping for is... Um, a formula, but the problem is there is no formula. What I do know is that God will never lead us in a way that violates his word. God will never lead us to be mean and hateful toward other people. That will never be the will of God. God will never lead us to lie and steal from others. That is never the will of God. God will never lead us to kill somebody else. That is not the will of God. God will never lead us 
to, to do harm to others, to be racist toward others. He'll never lead us to, to kill an, our unborn child. He will never lead us to do these things. And why do I know this? Because it's so clear in the word of God. He will never lead us to do what his word teaches us not to do. It will never be the will of God. He will never lead us to live with somebody else outside of marriage in a sexual relationship because he has already said, I don't know how many times in his word, that that is wrong. God will never lead us in a way that violates his word. That I do know. But here is what I've experienced in my life. I don't always know exactly the will of God about this particular decision, but I have a peace in my heart. I need to keep moving forward, and I just keep moving forward until God redirects my path. You know what I've discovered in my life? I've discovered that oftentimes God is at work in our lives, and we don't even know it. We don't even realize it through open and closed doors and however it is that he uses. He is at work in our life, and it isn't until we stop and we look back in our life is that we, oh, my soul, I cannot believe. Look what God was doing all along. As though God were behind the scenes moving things, moving our pathway, redirecting our lives. If you will look at Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, what he says is this. If you will trust God and put him first, you will not have to worry about it. Even when you don't know what God is doing, he is directing your path. Last night, God brought back to my heart as I was thinking about today, something that I don't believe I've ever shared with the church in my entire ministry. In the first few weeks of my first church that I pastored. I was 20 years of age. It was a little country church, 20 people in that church. In the first few weeks, I was a college student and I didn't know how to preach. I didn't, I didn't know how to lead those four people with me as their pastor. But God used that to begin my ministry. And I'd been a pastor of that church for a few weeks, and a woman came up, and and I didn't know who she was. She wasn't a member of that church. And and later, Kathy and I got to meet her and know her. She was about 15, 20 years older than me, and she came to the service, and when the service was over, she asked me if she could share something with me, and I said, sure. And she said, I've been praying for you, and God has given me a word to tell you. I said, well, okay. I, I... what? She said, God has given me a word to tell you about your life. And here's what she said. She said, God told me to tell you, it's very short. He's going to bless your ministry and you will pastor thousands and thousands, even 10,000 in your church. That was it. I heard her say that, and I, that didn't compute at all. I got 20 people in my church, and I'm just 20 years old. And honestly, I thought she's just being nice to me. That's how I thought it. I said, well, that's so nice of you. Thank you. I didn't actually take it all that seriously. I told Kathy what she said, and later Kathy and I be, actually became friends of this person, but I didn't take it seriously at all. A few weeks later, another woman came up to me, At the end of the service, she wasn't a member of the church. She went to the First Baptist Church in a town nearby. I'd never met her. She never met me. And she came to the service that Sunday. It was just a few weeks after the first woman came and talked to me. And she came up after the service. Could I say something to you? And I said, yeah, sure. And she said, I don't know you and you don't know me, but I'd heard that you were here and I can't get you off my mind. I've never met you. I didn't even know what you look like, but I've been praying for you and God has given me a word and I've never had this happen to me ever before. I am scared about this. I kept arguing with God and saying, I can't do this, but I have to be, I have to do it. And I've come to tell you a word. I said, wow, again? Well, okay, what? And do you know what she said to me? 
She said, I know you're going to think I'm crazy, but it, here's what God said to me. I am to tell you that God is going to bless your ministry, and you are going to be the pastor of thousands and thousands and as many as 10,000. And that's all I know God told me to tell you. I want to tell you something. When I heard that the second time, I didn't push it away. I, these two people had never met each other. They, to this day, don't, probably don't know each other. They didn't know the other one had come and said anything to me. I, I had to take this seriously. And every so often in my ministry, I go back to that moment. And last night, it came back to me. I hadn't thought about it, I guess, in over a decade or two decades. I hadn't thought about it. And last night, as I was preparing to talk to you, and I was thinking about this very principle, God brought those two things back to my heart. And I stepped back, and I looked back at my life. And I believe that God, all those years ago, I won't tell you how many years ago, at least 30 years ago, all those years ago, I believe God was telling me of what would happen when I came to be the pastor of Sugar Creek Baptist Church. I never tried to orchestrate anything. Good grief, I couldn't. But as I've stepped back over last night and I was looking at my ministry, I could have never predicted, I could have never maneuvered or manipulated, but all the while it was God ordering my steps. And I share this story with you for only one reason, God's doing that in your life. In ways you don't understand and situations you don't know about and open, closed doors and moving people into your life and you don't know, but God has a plan and a purpose for your life and he is ordering your steps to put you in the very place that he wants to use you and how he wants to bless your life. So trust in the Lord. Put him first in your life and trust him because he will order your steps. This is what Jesus is teaching us. And he will do it in his timing. God doesn't just meet our need. He does it in his timing. In the winter... Winter trees, in the winter trees are not fretting in January as to whether they'll get leaves. Our leaves fell in October, it's January, we don't have any leaves. Maybe we won't get any leaves, we've got to try hard to get some leaves. Trees don't do that. In January, they know that in March or April or May, depending upon the tree, leaves are coming. They don't have to worry. They don't have to str strive. They don't have to fret because leaves are on their way. God has made promises to you. And sometimes he waits because not only is he trying to get you in the right place, he, there are other people that are involved. He's got to get them in the right place. And he says, I've got a special timing. Trust me and wait on my timing. When both of my sons were in the fifth grade, I didn't hand them my car keys to my car. I did not do it. Now, I knew a day would come, and it scared the fool out of me, that they would one day be driving my car, but it was not when they were in the fifth grade. And I was not depriving them of anything by not giving them my car keys in the fifth grade. They weren't ready. I knew that a day would come in which they're ready. When they're 30 years old or so, then I'll let them drive my car. But there was a timing. There was a timing. And God is going to meet your need in his timing. Be patient with him. Now, all these things Jesus is saying when he then says this truth to us. Don't miss today by worrying about tomorrow. Therefore, you see, therefore means all that I've already said. Now, this is what I'm going to say. Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. 
There are two days of every week that we should not worry. The first day is yesterday. All our mistakes, all our failures, all of our disappointments, all of our pains and hurts, all the things that's so disappointed our life, things in which we said and did we wish we would have never done, are yesterday. It's time to let it go. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Would you close your eyes for just a moment? Would you just close your eyes where you are? Nobody looking around, just closing your eyes. And I want you to imagine what I'm going to describe for you. Just imagine this scene. You're in a motorboat. And you're going upstream against the stream in that motorboat. But it's a powerful motorboat. You don't have the wheel. No, somebody else is driving. You are sitting in a seat in the back of that motorboat and you are looking toward the back behind that boat. Now, as you're sitting there in that seat looking behind, you notice there's a rope that's tied to the boat and it then is tied to a barge that the boat is pulling. A barge is simply a small boat that's flat and it's pulling that barge and the barge is loaded with garbage. It's got all kinds of garbage, all the disappointments of your life, all the hurts and the wounds of your life, all, all the sins of your life, all the wrong things you've ever said and done. It is all piled up on that barge and it is so heavy. There is so much on that barge that it is straining now. This motorboat is straining to keep going against the current. And you realize that the motor is about to stall and you you call out to God, oh God, please, would you cut the rope of this old barge? And just as you pray that prayer out of heaven, can you see him comes Jesus and he's got an ax in his hand and with one fell swoop, he cuts that rope and all of a sudden the motorboat lunges forward. It's freed from the load. And now you see that the current has grabbed hold of of the barge full of garbage and it's now taking that garbage down the stream and around the curve and it's gone forever. It's time to be freed from yesterday from the mistakes and the sins and the disappointments and the wounds and the hurts. It's time to be free. Let's pray together. Oh God, move in hearts today that are listening to me. Oh God, bring freedom. Bring freedom. Release so many people right now of their sin as they ask your forgiveness. Release them. Free them, cut the rope to the barge. Forgive us, cleanse us, make us right before you. Oh God, you are stronger, you're more powerful than all of our disappointments and all of our lost opportunities. You are greater than all of them. And we let them all go. And we believe where you are taking us and we trust you. In Jesus' name. Amen. We need to be freed from the day of yesterday. There's a second day every week we need to be freed of, and that's tomorrow. We need to be freed of the worry about tomorrow. Do you remember a few weeks ago I quoted you the the study that was done by the National Science Foundation that discovered that 92% of the things that we worry about either don't come or don't come in the way and the intensity that we worried about? Only 8% of the things that we worry about actually materialize the way we worry about them. And God has already said, I'll take care of you. You know what I've discovered about God? God does not give us the grace today to handle tomorrow. God only gives us the grace today to handle today. Live in his grace one day at a time. I'm not saying cancel your life insurance because if you die, your family's going to need that. I am saying cancel your worry about tomorrow. Yes, you can plan, but cancel your worry 
about tomorrow. I want to close with this idea. Psalm 119, verse 105. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Let God's word guide you. Did you know that little lamp in the Old Testament? That little lamp was just a little little piece of clay, round piece of clay that held a little bit of oil in it, had a wick in it, and that's all of the light that it was. You can take the weakest flashlight and it would be tons more than that little bitty candle that they would hold. And all they had enough light was to go one step, then take the next step, then the next step. And here's what God says, my word can be a lamp to your feet. Would you just obey what God teaches you? Just listen to his word and say yes to him. Live one day at a time. Don't miss living today out of your disappointment of yesterday and your dread of tomorrow. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for your grace and your mercy in our life, for your leadership in our life. Oh God, we thank you for all that you are doing and will do. And we trust you, Father. We trust you with our life today, with the tomorrow. Oh God, now free us to live today. Move in hearts today, Father, who do not know Jesus as Savior, that this would be the day of their salvation. Move in their heart, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen.